Um, so here's what I want to do. Uh, I kind of want to get into a doctrinal discussion. I want to share some thoughts I've had. Uh, this is something from the mission. I've been thinking about this and just like, and because the question is, how does God work? And we talked about it last episode in, in sort of the context of like prayer and that a mission is, is this experiment and like, you know, you get to see, you get to pray for things, you get to work towards things and then, and then see how it turns out. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work as well as you thought. And so you learn things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I have a story and, and a thought and uh, I want to just speculate a little bit. What do you think, Lyndon? Oh, well, let's get cooking. Okay. Here's, so here's my premise. Here's the premise I'd like to work off of. Uh, I think that uh, God works in... So, okay, maybe I'll back up a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a story from my mission. This is from, uh, I was in this place called Dallas. I was with, uh, up to this point in my mission, I had been with my trainer and then my, my greenie buster. And then I trained a missionary. And then I trained another missionary after that. And then after that missionary, I got sort of my, just my next companion. And the two of us were just like two missionaries. And, um, this today, I love this man. I think he's been so like impactful in, on my life. But at the time, we really had our struggles, and we really, uh, I was very, I got very annoyed, and I was, I don't know, I'm not as good of a person maybe <laughs> then as I am now, or maybe I just don't have to live with a man constantly for two years. I don't know. Um, it can weigh on you. It can start to weigh on you. But um, one of the so here's one of the things that he did that really like bugged me was like I I was the only one of in our companionship who could drive. And so I was I was the driver. And he was a he was a big dude. He was a tall man and he was sort of a he was a large man. Was this the guy that would uh, bear hug you? This was uh, this was one of the men who would bear hug me. There were a few of them. Yeah, I can hardly, I can hardly believe that. Yeah. And uh, so, no, he was like yeah, he was this big tall dude. And he was this, uh, like, operatic singer. He was really good at singing. He had, like, this yo-yo that he would use sometimes, and that kind of bugged me a little bit. Are you, like, he would just yo-yo? He would bring his yo-yo around proselyting. We'd be in, like, a like a member's house, and I'd be, like, talking to the to the guy, the member dad or whatever. And then he'd just pull his yo-yo out and start yo-yoing sometimes. And I would just be... Like, like, you know, like was he doing a show? Was he, like, really good at it? He was pretty good, yeah. He was pretty good, but I would just be like, okay, so you're good for that. And then he'd be like, you know, like pull his, do a walk the dog. And I'm just like, oh. like, like people are they're like, no one's ready for your yo-yo. Yeah. Right <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? So this is like what's going through my mind. And maybe it played really well. I don't know. But I was just sort of like, what is going on? But um, so anyway, the thing that he used to do is we, we would be driving and he would put his whole, and when I'm driving, I like to have my, just like the top corner of the center console is for my elbow. That's where my elbow goes. Okay? I think as a driver, you have a right to that. Right. And he would put his whole, and he's got a big forearm, mind you. He would put his whole forearm on the center console. And he would take up the whole thing. Wouldn't even give you that little inch to <laughs> no. perch your elbow on. And he, and he, he was, it, George is a hot place. And he, you know, he had a sweaty forearm and hot. And I'm just like, I really want that corner. And here's the thing. I don't know if I ever even asked for it. So, and I'm sure he would have moved if I would have, but I just never did because that's the kind of person I was at the time. He should he should have known better. <laughs> yeah, he should have. Uh, I don't want to name this person, but I I I love you, Elder So and So. But that was annoying at the time. Um. So anyway, here's what happened. Okay, one day. One day we're driving and and up to this point, we'd had some like, it was one of these companionships where we were having like a spirituality off. Do you know what I mean? Like we're trying to compete, like who's more spiritual? Who's more like a Leahona, God guiding you from place to place kind of a thing. I'm unfamiliar with that. Okay. But go on. <laughs> <laughs> it's just this thing, you know, it's just like, I think, you know, I think we should go over here. The spirit's telling me to do this and be like. Okay. And then if you go down there and you meet someone and it's kind of a cool thing, it's like, okay, you're a human Leahona. God's really loves you and you're really in touch with the spirit. You're doing things right. And it was sort of like became a bit of a competition with this sort of a thing. And um, 
So we had a little bit of this, me and this companion, and to the point of one day, it sort of like was escalating until one day uh, we're driving, and I think I was reading, I think I read this in my journal a little bit ago, but I think I might have started this off. I thought he started it, but I think I, I, my journal says that I started it. I said, I think we need to go, you know, and this is out of the blue. This is like the spirit shooting information into my brain. And I'm like, oh, we're driving. I'm like, I think we need to go visit this one member. I think he might be in trouble. Oh. Or something or something like that. Or maybe like they couldn't find, maybe they couldn't find this one member. And I was like, we need to go over here. It was a situation like that. So I was like, let's go. And so we go to the place where I thought we should go. And then, and then out of nowhere, my companion says, Elder Cooper, we need to go to Olivet. Or we need, he's just like Olivet. Olivet, we need something to do with Olivet. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, Olivet, God, I just feel like God's telling me something to do with Olivet. And he's, I'm like, okay. okay, okay. Olivet? Olivet. You know, like the Mount of Olives or something. I don't know. Olivet. Okay. It's like a scripture. I, I don't know. But um, he's like, okay. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was trying to be more like, I was trying to be more, because I think we'd had some other arguments up to this point. So I think we're trying to be more supportive of each other. So he says this and I'm like, uh, okay. All right. So what do you, what do you mean? Where should we go? And he's like, I don't know, like a neighborhood or like a street or like a house or someone's name or, or what? And I was like, okay. And I was like, where should we go? And we're driving. He's like, turn here. I'm like, okay. And we like turn down this into this neighborhood. I was like, okay, now. And it seemed very urgent. It was all like, oh my goodness, someone's in trouble at Olivet Street or something. And we're trying to find something. And uh, I think this neighborhood was sort of had like all of uh, themed streets or something. Okay. And so we're like, oh, this is it. And so we like, we're kind of like trying to find like all of that. Where is it? And I think the <laughs> we we sort of like go here go there and then the closest thing i think we got to was that we got to an olive colored house and we were like this has got to be it olive i think and i don't know maybe there's a street called olive anyway we went on a horse like a crazy goose chase wild goose chase and then we got to like this house and we're like knocking it's like do you, do you is everything okay do you want to hear about the gospel of jesus christ and they're like no and then, like, shut the door in our faces. And we're like, huh, okay. And basically, like, we're, you know, we're very, he was very dejected at this point, right? Hmm. He was very, like, upset. And I'm, I'm here like a pig and crap, just like, and I'm sorry if that's, like, a swear. Is that a swear? Crap. No. Very self-conscious about that now. Um, Just, like, so, like, oh, you were wrong. I was right, man. Or, like, you know what I mean? Like, I was just so wallowing in his... The fact that he was like wrong, were you or experiencing some Schadenfreude? Yeah, in in a bad way, and uh, and so we kind of like we <laughs> we had a little talk, and I think I said some insulting things to him, in the form of like you're not so spiritual after all, or something like that. Wow. And uh, wow, yeah, I was a real, I was a little, I was a little stinker. And so anyway, we we sort of like we get home. And uh, this is late in the evening. We get home and we don't really talk to each other. And we sort of like have our time apart. And then we come back together and we're like, and 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 he says he says one thing where he says, um, I think I know what happened. That was neither the time nor the place where God would speak to me, or or any of us about anything. That's not how you receive revelation. And I was like, that's an interesting point. He's like. Maybe it's in planning. Maybe that's the time and place where God's sort of like working with us and, and you know, giving us revelation. So here's the point. My, my view of how God works in that moment, and in several moments like that, went from sort more of a mystic viewpoint to a practical viewpoint. Mm-hmm. You know, the mystic viewpoint being that we can receive on the fly sort of just like a voice in our head. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who would, you know, give me sort of a story that would counteract what I'm about to say. And that's great. But my experience has been, and that one specifically was, it seems like 
we can sort of trick ourselves into thinking something and maybe it's maybe it's different from what we thought or at least that was that's what that experience taught me it was just like we both had like these weird little impressions to go down find all of that or find some like huh and the question now becomes how does god work is it is it Mm -hmm. like like a voice in your head is it like random sort of synapse thoughts like i don't know Well, well here's uh here's a few thoughts sure during my multiple years of academic study I uh, looked at William James in a psychology of religion class. Yeah. He talks about the, his, one of his famous books is the varieties of religious experience. Yeah. Where he actually takes a scientific approach to religious experience, like mysticism. Yeah. And he comes up with, uh, he's like the, I think it's five. There's like five points that actually make something uh, like a mystical, a true mystical experience. And uh, you probably can't remember them all off the top of my head, but it's like some of it's noetic, which is like a Greek word for like knowledge. Yeah. So it's like you have to learn something from it. Um, It's like ineffable, which is like you can't explain it. Like it's kind of very difficult to explain how or what. That's why, you know, you're talking about the warm fuzzies or the the still small voice. It's kind of like it's very hard to explain. It's ineffable. And it's like you can't trigger it is like another thing. And then uh, what does that mean? You can't trigger it. Well, cause like, I think a lot of people think like I'm going to receive revelation because, uh, like an example is like Joseph Smith. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Moroni visits him or the first, the, his, uh, account of the first vision, like hits all these points basically. Yeah. Where it's like, he learns something, he can't explain it. Like he gets visited by an angel when he's like crossing the fence and stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, he sort of triggered it by going to the grove of trees to pray, right. but he wasn't trying to. Okay, so it was, it's just it's independent of what you can yeah. do to sort of make it happen. Yeah, like you can't yeah. like you're not going to be like you can't force you can't tempt God or something. like yeah you're like I'm going to receive revelation because I'm in the celestial room of the temple. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. get some pushback on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, but so, it's fair, right? Like you really can't, like you're not just like I'm just. You can't just force. You can't tempt God, right? Like that's the idea is that you can't yeah. just like force His hand to be like, okay, I'm here, talk to me. You're like, I prayed. Now time for a mystical experience, right? Uh, so I, yeah, I probably could look up all five of them, but I always say like it is nice that uh, you know Joseph Smith's visions fall under that category. But that's the thing is, those are very rare. Yeah, mystical experiences very rare Mm -hmm. you're like impressions that you get throughout the day probably just a result of your own cognitive abilities well yeah it's like elder bednar he's talking about you know yeah he was asked that question like how do i know if it's me or if it's the spirit when i have a good idea (laughs) and he's just like his his answer was are you a good boy guy's like uh yeah i try to be he's like well then it doesn't matter it doesn't matter which where it comes from because if it's a good idea it's a good idea. And this is something that I really got caught up on really badly. Like when I got home from my mission it was just like, Oh, what is, what does God want me to do? And what, you know, like how am I doing things right? Am I, is God, you know, is this what I should do God? And often I feel like the answer was typically something like, I don't know, bro. What do you think you should do? And so it, it comes down, and I think a lot of people have this, this thing where it's like when they're praying to God and they're, you know, maybe they want more of an answer. I know that's always my, you know, that's always been my, uh, my leaning is like, I want more of an answer than I'm maybe getting yeah. in, in, a, in a more profound uh, way. And it's kind of been like that my whole life. Like I'll have little, little impressions and I think, uh. And I think that's probably more, you know, it's the small, simple, that sort of process. But, um, but yeah, what are you looking up right now? I'm trying to look up these, uh, the little keys that make a mystical state. Okay. So here's the, here's the big question. How does God work? How does he actually work? Um, I have a theory. Let's hear it. Here's my theory. Um, and this comes back to, there's a, there's a 
there's a a premise that has to be laid down first, and the premise is because uh, there's uh, there's two lines of thought, right? In in the idea that like God that God knows things. If God knows everything before it happens, right? That's premise number one. God knows everything, future, past, present, before it's happened, and so as we experience it. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of two things is going on there. Either on the one hand, he uh, is sort of like this statistical master, where he knows all the possibilities, all the possible outcomes. You know, the decision trees of everyone he takes into account, how they affect each other. Right. He knows all of that, and so that's the way. And so what that what that path does is it, is it in most people's minds what it does is it preserves uh, free will and agency. Mm-hmm. To be able to be like, well, because it hasn't actually happened yet, he doesn't actually know exactly what's going to happen. He just knows all the possibilities. Then people are like, okay, I get to still do what I want. The other possibility is that we've already done, it's already happened. That's the other thing. Like that it's already happened, that it's already done. And um, he knows it because he can see the future that has already happened. Because he doesn't live in time. Right. We live in time. We live in time. I think... But, and I think what people think about this is, and it's maybe like a, I think it's a false uh, assumption, is that people don't like that idea because it's the idea that um, you can, that you are predestined to something. If it's already happened, what choice do I have? Well, now we're into Calvinism. Yeah. But I don't think, I don't think those two things are necessarily the same thing. I don't think you necessarily have to, this is sort of like an epiphany I had one day. Where I was trying to, it was kind of bugging me. But I think, I think it's the second one where it's all already happened, but we have a choice the whole time. We're, we're making our fate the whole time. I think it's both. (laughs) What do you think? Why not? (laughs) Why not indeed? Uh, So I, yeah, I've under, I understand the whole, like, it's all just a big algorithm. Yeah. And God just knows the algorithm. Uh-huh. And we're the ones who push the switches on the decision tree. Yeah. But he knows, you know, he's like, in this circumstance, this will happen. He's yeah. got it all figured out. Yeah. So and you're so, more of a, and, you're more of like a decision tree thinker. Yeah. Okay. But then there's also like, well, technically everything's already done. Yeah. But if it, <laughs> But if it's already done, nothing we do matters. Well, no, it does matter because the decisions that you make... It's, us, it's, de- us deciding that it matters is what matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like if I... If, if in the end, you know... I think it's, it's one of those things where it's like you have to, to view it from, from our perspective, from our right now, it's, it's still happening. And it's still fluid. And that, okay, so that's the other sort of part of this this theory, is that is this timeline? Is it fluid? Can it be changed? Is it is it set in stone or can it be altered? And I think it can be altered. Let me explain. And this is where. And I think now here's okay. Like, so you you think uh, um, you know the Black Panther and Spider Man are they're coming back? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. It's all, I, it can all be undone. That's right. Well, here's... Okay. So, I think that we're on the optimal timeline. Okay. And, and and this all sort of gets swooped up into the power of prayer. This is what I think the true power of prayer is. So, you kind of think of time the way Dan Harmon does. How's that? Well, if you've watched Rick and Morty... I have. ...and Community... Yeah. Um, this is a thing that... It, in his shows, he often deals with time, yeah. and time fractures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the only way that you can like travel back in time, or anytime you do anything that changes time, it splits into a new timeline. Yeah, it's one just like it's the theory of physics, right? Right, right, right. A deci- whenever you come to a decision, you're you're splitting the universe into those two decision options. Yes. Um, new timelines. Yeah, and so uh, I think. And, and, and I think this, this accounts for people's agency, too. So when you pray for something, when you pray for, like, um, I don't know, I want to make it to uh, work safely today, or I'm going on a trip, I want to be safe, I want to arrive safely, a simple request. 
mm-hmm. seemingly. But I think that w- when you make a prayer like that up to God, now God views, you know, time outside of time. It's just the timeline. He, it's like a movie thing where he's like, he's seen everybody's, all of what's happened uh, outside of, of how we're experiencing it. And so he can go right back to the beginning and he can affect it. And we know that he can affect it because he's, you know, that's the scriptures. That's all the scriptures. Uh, Whenever God deals with man, he's affecting the timeline. Do you agree? I will allow this. Well, because he's, he's making himself known. He's, he's becoming an actor in, in the part of it. But I think he only intervenes as much as, as our agency will allow. What if he's not an actor and he only intervenes through others? Oh, I'm just, you kind of blew my mind a little bit right there. Yeah. What do you mean? How so? Um, Is the implication that, um, because if God appears at all, like if we're getting into like theology, it's like after the garden of Eden, God has not physically been on earth. Like his feet haven't touched the ground or, no. or he just hasn't physically been on earth. No. And it's like when you, when Moses and Joseph Smith see him, they're seeing projections. Of him. <laughs> so have they actually <gasps> seen him? Yeah. Oh man. But Dude, you're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> this is good stuff. Well, I mean, it's good stuff, except that like some Mormon scholar is going to say it's apostasy to say that God has not returned to the earth or something. Well, it's true that he's never he's, like actually set his foot on the earth and Jesus hasn't. That's like a sort of a doctrinal point is that like Jesus yeah. has not set his foot on the earth since he since he left. Since he left. Um so is it unreasonable to Or then think, then like and then God the Father has not since the Garden of Eden. That's interesting. Okay, well, under that premise either way, the 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 the, the point is God is influencing the world. He's an actor inside. He, he can affect the timeline at any point on the timeline. Or he can only affect people who can affect the timeline. Or that. I'm is gonna, is I'm, it the same thing? I don't know. No, because that's a little bit different. If you can affect someone who's going to affect the timeline, it's like, how it. is he affecting them? Is it through his thoughts and feelings? Is it through a way that most of us experience religion and God is, is through sort of more subtle... A little less mystic, you know, more just like thoughts and feelings, impressions, um, the pull to do what's right. Um, Well, well, that is a a branch of study in the psychology of religion is that mystical states are well understood that they happen. Yeah. They don't know why they happen. Right. And then it's like, so in in that sense, is your brain just a receiver for God? And then the other things that are kind of more like your own cognitive biases, uh-huh. is that just God's built-in programming so that you will carry out his will? That's interesting. And then when he needs a more direct thing, that's a mystical state. Oh, Lennon, you're, uh, you're opening all sorts of doors for me. The doors of perception. <laughs> let, me, let me finish my point, and then we can circle back around. I think this is how it works. I think you, you make a prayer to get somewhere safely up you know, to God. And then what God does is he can, he can take this and say, all right, how do I make this safe? How do I make this a safe thing? I need to go all the way back to, I don't know, five weeks ago. And I need to make sure that this bus driver who otherwise would have crashed into this car up, up over here in the present day, five weeks ago, I need to make sure that he um, eats a cheeseburger on Thursday night. So his iron doesn't get too low. So his iron doesn't get too low. So blah, 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 butterfly effect, chain reactions up to this point. Um, so, you know, you, make, you say the prayer. God goes back in time, affects the timeline. And all that you know is that you made it to your place safely. But maybe behind the scenes, God is doing all this, like, all this orchestration in the background to make this thing happen. Because he's outside of time and he can affect the timeline. And that's how you can affect the timeline more uh, actively. But isn't the whole point of the butterfly effect is because that man ate a cheeseburger that day, meat consumption rose five weeks ago. Maybe, you know, that changed the price of beef, (laughs) drove a rancher out of business. He blows his brains out. (laughs) 
so that you can <laughs> arrive safely that day. You know, isn't what? that the whole point of the butterfly effect? Is like you change one thing and oh, it and ripples it out of control. Maybe, or then he's got to make sure then because he, the bus driver also can't get sal- salmonella from that burger. Yeah, yeah. So then he's got to go back five weeks to make sure that sure, yeah. the burger cook's girlfriend doesn't leave him. Yeah, yeah. So that he gets enough rest. <laughs> So, so that, that he, he doesn't under so he doesn't yeah. undercook burgers because he's distraught oh, from the breakup. I imagine this process would would be extremely difficult. But as we know from the New Testament, is there anything too hard for the Lord? No, no. Alternatively, um, God is not governed by the prayers of men. Uh, so says that one guy from the Joseph Smith. Movie. Well, and I think he's hundred percent right. And here's the thing: no, but we know you look that, at you look at the Bible dictionary. And it says prayer is just a tool yeah. for men to align their will with God, mm. not for God's will to be aligned with men. But it, but does God had God decided long ago if you were going to survive your drive today? I don't know if He did. I think He did. I don't think He did. I think because you were to pray, there's numerous like, scriptures. Let's all get us here safely. It just means you're supposed to now drive safely. But there's a lot of things out of our control as well, and I think that's what, of course. We have to do what's in our control, but anytime, otherwise, why would you pray to God? Honestly, like, if only to, to affect things that are outside of your control. To, al- to align your will with his. To align your will with his. But we hear, there's so many scriptures that talk about, like, um, there's that, my favorite one that's sort of on this subject. Because if your prayers don't get answered, it just wasn't the will of God. Right. And you have to remember that. That is important to remember. But so I, if your prayers can't affect his will, why pray to change his will? Because maybe his will is, we do know that like his, if he's going to do something is sometimes predicated on us asking. I think that's... Asking you shall receive. Asking you shall receive. And I think that's a lot of what you our You shall receive is. the desire to do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of like agency and a lot of, I think agency dictates that we ask for things. Otherwise, he can't interfere. I think that's what a lot of it is. It's like, I God cannot interfere for good in your life in, in a lot of ways until you ask him. Because until you give consent. Because if he, if he just does something, <laughs> hashtag consent, um, if he just does something in your life uh, that he's, he's violating your agency in a way, I'm sure if he wanted to do that, he could. I'm well, sure there's, did, uh, you know, Jonah swallowed by a whale. Swallowed by a whale. He sure. didn't consent to that. It was for his good, though. Is that literal? I don't know. <laughs> well, I would, you could say it's all mythology. <laughs> it's almost like there's this great mythological theme of chaos and order. Yes. And we feel like... By praying to God, it inches us away from the chaos and yeah. closer to the order. Yeah. Because we are not powerful enough to bring order to traffic. You do feel a little better when you pray, though, don't you? And that's why it's pragmatic. It is pragmatic. I think uh, I think that's a good place maybe to stop. We can pick this up next time. Unless you have any other thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're just trying this out like maybe a little bonus episode this week. Uh, see if you guys like it or not. Um, let us know how you feel about the things that we said. I feel like you've. I, I think most people are gonna pull an Alex Williams and be like, I don't know. <laughs> they're gonna be like, I have some thoughts and feelings, and then they, when they want to write it down, they're gonna. They're, uh, it's too deep. It's too scary. Too deep. Joseph Smith did say, "You gotta stare into the abyss, man. You gotta stare into the abyss, and you gotta like look in there. You gotta gaze was- into the heavens." There was another 19th century prophet that also said that (laughs) out of Germany. (laughs) He will not be named on this podcast, (laughs) but I think it's true. I think you got to, uh, you got to try to understand those mysteries and to all who seeketh, it shall be given and opened up unto. So anyway, those are, those are my thoughts. Those are my theories. Gospel of Troy. Um, but I like to, uh, I like to sort of, I like to, Pull, excuse the uh, analogy, but pull the veil and see how the sausage gets made a little bit. And I, th- <laughs> sorry, and I, and I think that's uh, that's my theory. 
God is outside the timeline. You pray. He goes back in time to affect the timeline to make that prayer happen. If it aligns with, uh, that's another question I was going to ask you, actually. Do you think God's like a most good for the most people sort of guy? Or is he, you know, is he, is there a priority well, gotta, given to the most righteous? we want to start talking about meta ethics. Yeah. I got a, I got a lot to say. Next time. Next time. Meta ethics. We'll write it down. Uh, yeah. Please let us know. Do you have any uh, feedback? The Mission Stories podcast at gmail.com or you can slide into our dm of our instagram the mission stories podcast or you can go to our website and we have a little form you can fill out to contact us and let us know there what you thought what your feelings were how did you like what we said i'm trying to swear less i'm sorry for swearing whoever said that i think there's i think you're gonna get a lot of emails people asking you to swear more okay well let's uh let's we'll see we'll vote on it Uh, we love you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, uh, Lyndon, any last words? Um, I guess just shout out to all the new listeners. Yeah. I've just gotten the feedback that there are, there are new listeners. Awesome. Welcome to the club. Uh, the champions club. I don't know. What should we call our true, the true and faithfuls. Welcome to the true and faithfuls club. Yeah. Uh, you are so welcome and you're part of the best uh, group of people on the planet. <laughs> Um, we love you. Lennon, say the thing you always say. Stay true and faithful, listeners. Stay true and faithful. Bye-bye. <laughs>